pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, Lord. We thank you for the, the wonderful week that you've given us, Lord, and just the opportunity to come to you this wonderful morning, Lord, and just to receive thy word. Lord, I do pray that you please be with Pastor, give him utterance and boldness to preach and to teach this morning. Lord, have us open up our hearts, be receptive to thy word, Lord, so that uh, we may better walk with thee, Lord, and um, we may have better uh, boldness to go out and give the word to those who are seeking you, Lord. Lord, I do pray for those who haven't made it here yet, Lord, <coughs> whatever their endeavor is in front of them, I just ask you, please, Lord, get them through it and bring them here safely. Lord, please be with those who are going to be watching this later on uh, virtually, Lord, that it just be an encouragement to them. Lord, I just cross in your glorious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School Hour at Valley Baptist Church in Paso Serrano. You can find us at valleybaptistelpaso.com. We are on YouTube. Our Sunday School Hour is on YouTube. And our evening service is on YouTube. And right now we are studying a lesson from the ABCs of Christian Maturity about the tabernacle. The tabernacle. And... Um, we stopped in page 296, page 296, set and order is the section that we're going to work on this morning, set and order. After the components of the tabernacle were crafted, the Lord instructed Moses to put together the things that are to be set in order. In other words, God had a plan for the very arrangement of this structure. Nothing was left to man's imagination or devising, okay? The tabernacle is strictly, completely a design and structure created by God, and it mirrors, it mirrors the one in heaven, okay? So let's go to Exodus 40, Exodus 40, and verse number 4. Exodus 40, verse number 4. The Bible says, And thou shalt bring in the, the table and set it in order. Excuse me. Let me do that again. And thou shalt bring in the table and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick and light the lamps thereof. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord God, for these who are here this morning. We pray for those that are missing. Uh, hurry them along and bring them here safely, Lord. I pray that you bless this lesson, that you give us uh, understanding, Lord, that we may receive uh, what you have for us this morning, that we may learn more about the tabernacle and at the same time learn more about you, Lord. Holy Spirit of God, you are our teacher. Teach us this morning, I pray. We ask it in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so... Uh, Nothing was left to man's imagination or devising. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that nothing is left to man's imagination? Everything, everything is set in order by God. His plan of salvation, his uh, taking of his church to heaven, and the tabernacle is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it shows us... Uh, a picture of how we can have access to God. How we can have access to God. All right? So page 296 said in order, the first, uh, mile, uh, the first uh, bullet there says, God is not the author of confusion. confusion. Okay? 1 Corinthians 14.33. 1 Corinthians 14.33. First Corinthians 14, number 33. It says, for, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Okay? And that, that speaks to us right there. That speaks to us. Okay? God is not the author of confusion. Okay? 
So, question, if God is not the author of confusion, then who is, Danny? That's right. But how does it speak to us individually? How does that speak to us individually, Mrs. White? Mm-hmm. Okay, so God is the God of order. Uh, if you look at verse number 40, he says, let all things be done decently and in order, okay? Uh, his church is a church of order, okay? It's not a church of confusion. There's no jumping and hollering and all that wild stuff. There's no dancing, okay? Because uh, John... Um, 4, 24 tells us that God is a spirit, okay? And he seeks, he seeks those that worship him in spirit and in truth, okay? So, set in order. Good morning, good morning. We are, we are, are in uh, page 296 in our notes, 296, section set in order. And uh, section A, 296A, it's order in the books, in the book of Exodus. It's order in the book of Exodus, okay? This is significant in illustrating God's grand plan of salvation, okay? The tabernacle is, illustrates God's grand plan of salvation. And uh, we find this in... Uh, chapters 19 to 23, the law of God was given. That's where the law of God was given in chapter uh, Exodus 19 to 23. The Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20. Okay. And uh, we see here that the law of God was given the purpose for the law of God. Okay. And it's uh, four purposes. And the first one is. Uh, Romans 7, 12, Romans 7, 12, and Romans 7, 12, the Bible says, Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good, okay? And so the first reason that, the, that God gave us the law is to show his holiness, to show his holiness, we serve a holy God, okay? We serve a holy God. God is our God, the creator of the universe. There is no other God, okay? There is no other God. He is the creator, and everything that was created was created by God. And he is a holy God. Second reason he gave us the law was to prove, to prove our sinfulness. To prove our sinfulness. Not to show us our sinfulness. To prove that we are sinful. To prove that we are sinful. Okay? Raise your hand if you never told a lie. No hands went up. Okay? That proves that we're all sinful, okay? We have a sinful nature, okay? Uh, when we were born, we were born with a sinful nature, all right? So God made a way for us to be saved, to be delivered from the power of sin. And he gave us the law to show his holiness, to prove our sinfulness. Number three, to show man's helplessness, to show our helplessness, okay? To show our helplessness, Galatians 3.21. Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3 and verse number 24. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So that the reason the law was given was to show our helplessness, okay? 
How does the law show, it says here that it was a schoolmaster, okay? A schoolmaster. What is a schoolmaster? That's the word that, that is used probably more in, in the European area or maybe the Far East, okay? Who would use a schoolmaster? Who would use a schoolmaster? A rich family, a rich family would hire a schoolmaster to teach their children, okay? That's the origin of it, okay? But God gave us the law to be our schoolmaster, to be our teacher, okay? To be our teacher and to show us our helplessness, okay? He, uh, Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Okay? So if the reason is to show us our helplessness, how does the law show us our helplessness? Brother White. Galatians 3.21. That is correct. Thank you. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have been given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Okay? So if the law would give life, then righteousness should have been by the law. Okay? But the law was given to us to show our helplessness. Therefore, the question stands. How does the law show us our helplessness. So then on that the state can't be out and help do you think the apartment? Okay. Very good, very good. All good answers, all very good answers, okay? That is correct, no one could keep the law, no one. And it was created like that by design. It was created like that by design, okay? And even though it was created by that by design, the very people that it was given to, they're still trying to keep it, okay? They actually have deceived themselves into thinking that Perhaps they could keep it. And they try and they try and try, and they fail and fail and fail. Because the only one that could keep the law had to be sinless. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Very good. And you know what? We were perfect. We were perfect. That's a good answer. Do you realize that we were created? to live forever? We were created to live forever. God created us to live forever, okay? But of course, you know what happened. You know the story, okay? So it shows us our helplessness because we can't, that's why the Bible says uh, in Romans 3.10, for all, no, no, as it is written, there is not righteous, no, not one. And in verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come Short, short of the glory of God. We can't reach it, okay? By ourselves, we can't do it, okay? It has to be through Jesus Christ. And that's the key to this lesson right here. It has to be through Jesus Christ. He's the only way, okay? And so uh, the fourth reason, uh, it drives man to God, okay? Look at Galatians 3.24 now. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so the law drove us to Jesus Christ. Okay? So, Exodus chapter 25 to 30, those chapters right there, show us the grace of God 
And right here in, the, in those sections, the grace of God is pictured. We get a picture of the grace of God. Remember that grace <coughs> means undeserved favor. Okay? Undeserved favor. And they really go, grace really goes together with mercy, with the word mercy. Okay? Because in our sinful condition, the only thing that we deserve was to go where? To go to hell. That's the only place we could go. Okay? And that's what we really deserve. But God did not give us that punishment. Instead, he withheld that punishment. And that withholding of the punishment, holding back what we rightly deserve, that is called mercy. That is God's mercy. That he did not give us what we deserve. Okay? And the wonderful thing about mercy, mercy is just like grace. Because mercy, the Bible says, the mercies of God are, they're new every morning. They're new every morning. Okay? And grace is the same way. Okay? Grace is undeserved favor. So he holds back what we deserve. And then he gives us what we don't deserve. That's called grace. Okay? Grace. And when you fail, guess what? There's more grace. And when you fail again, there's more grace. And it never ends. There's always abundance of grace. Greater than all of our sins. So there's grace always. Aren't you glad? Isn't that comforting to know that, yeah, we're going to fail. Yeah, we're going to trip. Yeah, we're going to do something that we shouldn't do. And that's because we have a sinful nature. But now that we have been transformed, we don't go seeking sin. Okay? We abstain from sin. Whereas before, we just surrender right into it. We just did it. But now we, don't, we say, oh, no, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. I don't smoke anymore. Thank you. I don't drink anymore. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see us in our natural state. That's right. And he sees us through Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing to me. That is good. That's very good. Uh, when the Lord Jesus came, not only did he forgave us of, his, of our sins, but he delivered us. He delivered us from the power of sin. And then when he took our sins and the sins of the entire world upon himself, and he paid our sin debt that we could not pay, he paid it for us by dying on the cross because the law required payment. And the payment was death. So he took our death for us. Okay? He tasted death for us, the Bible says. And then when he took our sins upon himself, guess what? He gave us his righteousness. And that's what Brother White's talking about right there. Okay? So when God sees uh, Joe Serrano, he doesn't see... Uh, the old, uh, sinful, wicked, drunkard Joe Serrano, no. He sees the righteousness of his son applied on me. And that's what he sees. Okay? So, in uh, page 296, number 2, the grace of God is pictured. Okay? So let's go to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, verses 19 to 28. Hebrews 9, 19 to 28. The Bible says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkle both the book and all the people. Okay? Remember, hyssop is a plant like a bush, which is the same plant they use. Where else did they use that? That's right. To, to, put, to put the blood upon the lentil and the frame of the 
door when they left Egypt. Because God said, you have to kill a lamb, a lamb for a family, has to be your best lamb. Take the blood and put it on the lentil and on the post of the door. And when the destroyer would come that night, if he saw the blood, he would pass over. Just like the song says, I will pass, pass over you. Okay? And no one will be hurt. But if the person did not apply the blood, look at that. You have to apply the blood so the destroyer will pass over you. But what happened if the person said, oh, I, I'm not going to do that. I think, I don't want to kill a little lamb. You know, I, I don't like blood. I, I think we'll just, we'll just nail our uh, attendance record. You know, we've been faithful in church. We'll just be putting our attendance record in there. <coughs> or we'll put our tithing record for the year. <coughs> or we put our membership <coughs> certificate, our baptism certificate. <coughs> what would happen if the destroyer came? Would it pass over? No. Okay? You have to apply the blood. The word of God is such that you have to follow it to the order. You cannot change it. Remember, nothing was left to the imagination or devising of man. It was all designed by God. You have to follow it. Okay? And if you don't follow it, you will get yourself in trouble. Okay? So, uh, here, remember that we talk, this is where we stopped last time. Remember that God is a God of, what do we say? Okay, God is the God of order, okay. But God is the God of what? Mercy, yes. God is a God of covenants. He is the God of covenants, okay. He made covenants with his people. He made covenants with Abraham with all his, uh, uh, his descendants, with David, with Solomon, okay? God is a God of covenant, okay? And the way a covenant is a contract that they, did, that they used to use in the old times, okay? If you were going to make a contract with somebody, you would kill an animal and cut it in half. You would put the two sides like this, and then both of you you and the other person that you made the contract with would walk in between those animal parts. And by, by doing that, you were testifying and saying, let this happen to me if I don't keep the contract. Okay? So God has got a contract. So what are they doing here? They're taking the blood. Okay? And what is Moses doing? He's spraying the people with the blood. The people are saying, we made a covenant with God. And the blood was applied to them. Okay? That's what this is about right here. Verse number 20. Saying that this is the blood of the testament which God had enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Okay? Without the shedding of blood... There is no remission. And the word remission means no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay? That is the covenant. That is the contract. Okay? And so, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things, notice that the words, it's a pattern of things in where? In heaven. Okay, so we're... So we are, they were following a pattern of something that is done in heaven, okay? Should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which, which are the figure of the true, okay? So when Jesus went uh, to heaven to take his blood, because... What was required? You cannot have remission without the shedding of. So he took his blood to heaven, okay, to present it to his Father in heaven. And God the Father was appeased, okay? He accepted the sacrifice, okay? Now you have to be reminded of the sacrifices here. Why was the reason of all those sacrifices? We went over this before, but I'll remind you. 
Okay? Whenever a person would come uh, once a year to the tabernacle, wherever it was, uh, they would bring a lamb. It had to be the best looking lamb. It had to be white. It could not be missing any ears or legs or tails or anything. And it couldn't have any spots. It had to be the best. Okay? Now, there's, there's a tradition. Uh, there are many books that were written that are not canonized into the scriptures. Okay? Like historical books, like Josephus, that tells us that when the uh, shepherds, okay, would, uh, when the sheep, the you, the you sheep with the female sheep, okay, the ewes, that's why you never call a urine sucker you, because you say, what? You're calling me a female sheep? <laughs> and he would beat you up, okay? So when the ewes would have their baby lambs, they would take them right there as soon as they came out, okay? Perfectly white and pure as could be, right? And they would wrap them. They would wrap them in swaddling clothes. What's the picture of that? You get in the picture? And then they, to keep it from getting dirty and getting all contaminated and everything, because they was going to go to the temple, okay? So they would keep it in, guess what? In the manger. They would keep it in the manger, okay? So it would stay nice and clean. You see the picture? Everything's connected, okay? So Jesus here is, so the, the, the scripture here in verse 24 is telling us that Jesus, he didn't go take the blood to the tabernacle here on the earth. No, no, look. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. No, 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 that would be the earthly one, right? Made with hands. We, they, they put it together. They, they, they constructed it. No, he didn't go there. But because that is only a figure of the true. But into the heaven itself. He went to heaven. That's why when he resurrected and he came out of the tomb, uh, one of the ladies was going to hug him and just worship him. And he told her, no, please don't touch me. Okay, but he, because he had to ascend. He had not yet ascended to take the blood. Okay? Now to appear in the presence of God for us. So he went to heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. He took the blood. He took the sacrifice. So on the earth here, a person would take a little lamb to the tabernacle. They would slit his throat. They would catch the blood. It would be sprinkled around the altar. Okay? And then they would burn it. And by, by doing that, the person was telling God, Lord, I have sinned. I have a lot of sins this year. Lord, I can't pay for these sins. Lord, will you take a substitute? Will you take this lamb? And the Lord would accept it. And his sins would not be forgiven. His sins would only be covered for another year. And then he would have to do it again and again. And again, why? Because we have a sinful nature. So imagine how many little lambs died. But all those little lambs were pointing us to the capital L, Lamb of God. You see, he was going to come one day and he would be crucified for us. And that would be our sacrifice once for all. No more sacrifices. Okay. And so that's what it's talking about right here. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. So the, the, the priest, the high priest would, would go into the holies of holies only once a year and he would take the blood and put it around the ark because the ark was, uh, it represented the, the presence of God but the top of the ark it's called the mercy seat because the top of the ark had two angels which were facing each other and then and their wings were stretched out like that facing each other and right there in the middle that's called the mercy seat and there would be the presence of God God would come and meet with Moses and that's where he would come right there okay so the, the high priest would have to go in there once a year to account for the sins of the entire nation. The entire nation. Okay? Again, every year. 
every year. Okay, so uh, verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Okay, so if Jesus, if Jesus was required to do that, think about it. He would have to be sacrificed over and over and over and over. You see that? And that's what Catholic Church does every Sunday. Okay? They literally sacrifice the Lord Jesus every Sunday. But here it says, For then must we often have, verse 26, suffer since the foundation of the world. But now, now, okay, once in the end of the world had he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once. Key word. Once. Okay? Verse 27. And... Is that it's appointed unto man once to die, but after there's the judgment. So Christ was once offered, again the key word, once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Okay? So Jesus took the sins of the entire world upon himself. And by doing that, he, the Bible says that God made him, Jesus, to become sin for us, okay? So when he took the sins of the world upon himself, he became sin, okay? But you have to understand here, and it has to be very clear in your mind, he became sin. He did not become a sinner because he's sinless, okay? But when he took our sins upon himself, he became sin to be able to pay our sins on the cross because the law required death. For the wages of sin is, that's what Jesus did. He paid our sin debt. We couldn't pay it. The only one that could pay it had to be sinless. Sinless. And the only one that's sinless is Jesus. He's the only one that could pay our sin debt. Okay? So, he's the only one that could pay our sin debt. Okay, we move on to page 297, letter B. So we saw the order in the book of Exodus. Now let's look at order in the camp. Order in the camp of the Israelites. It's order in the camp of the Israelites. Let's look at Numbers 1. Numbers 1. Numbers 1. Verse 51. Numbers 1, verse 51. Numbers 1, 51 to 54, the Bible says, And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, and every man by his own standard, throughout their host. But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of testimony, that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of testimony. And the children of Israel did, did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. Okay? So did they. All right? So... The camp was arranged in three great circles, okay? It was arranged in three great circles. I wrote three little circles out of my notes right here, okay? A big one, then a smaller one, then a smaller than that, okay? And the, the, the lesson says the outer circle comprised the warriors, the warriors, and, the fa and their families. The inner circle was made up of the workers, the Levites, then the tabernacle itself, and Moses and Aaron in the center, the worshipers. Okay? You see that? And I just read 51 to 54. Okay? So if you have a military mind, 
uh, you can read on your own 51 to 54, and tell me how many military things do you see there? Okay? And you'll realize that everything that we do is military came from God. Okay? The formations, <laughs> the camping, the, the moving, everything came from God. So just read it on your own, 51 and 54. If something pops up that is military in nature, you know where it came from. Okay? You know where it came from. The note says... Uh, these happen to be three key aspects of the Christian life, okay? So these three areas are key aspects of the Christian life. These are things that should be in your life. If you are born again believer, these three things should be visible in your life, okay? They should be visible in your life, all right? The first circle, we said, were the warriors, okay? The warriors, the outer circle, the most outer circle, were the warriors. So let's go to 2 Timothy 2.3. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.3. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 3. The outer circle was the warriors... That would be the warriors in their families. That would be the different tribes, okay? There's 12 tribes make up the, the nation of Israel. So, in verse number, uh, chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a what? Good soldier of Jesus Christ, okay? I don't know if you realize, I do not know if you realized it or not, when you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you became part of his army. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jehovah, okay, Jehovah, which is translated into English, uh, Lord, O capitalized letters, L-O-R-D, capitalized, that's Jehovah in English, okay? He is the Lord of hosts. That's his name, okay? He is the Lord of armies, all right? He is the Lord of armies, and he has gigantic armies. I mean, he is surrounded by armies of angels of all ranks, okay? And so it says here, Paul, writing the second letter to Timothy, his son in the faith, this is known as the last will and testament of the Apostle Paul because it is his last letter. And the words of a man, the last words of a man are very important before he dies. And these are his words. And he told Timothy, Thou therefore endure harness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure harness. Okay? Harness. Okay, so think military with me. I have this thought. Think military with me, okay? So you enlist in whatever service you, you, you want to enlist, okay? You, you, it's your choice, okay? So, uh, Brother Craig, you, you're going to enlist. What service are you going into? All right. Brother White, well, he's a Marine for life, so uh, he's a Marine. Uh, okay, we have an a, a, a Army guy over here. Uh, <laughs> we had a missionary going to Mexico. He was a captain, okay? Uh, he was coming from Tennessee somewhere. Anyway, he was going to Mexico, and uh, he went into the Army. He was a Marine and went into the Army. So when he stopped by, I asked him, hey, why would somebody do that? Why would you do that? Why would you leave the Marines and go to the Army? He said, ah, oh, Brother Joe, he said, if, if every Marine left the Army, there wouldn't be any Army. Okay, so so <laughs> they make up the army. <laughs> You're an example. <laughs> no, no, it's 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 uh, 
it's, uh, you, you, as, a man, as a man, you have to do what you have to do. Okay? It's, it's your responsibility, and you have to provide for your family. So, you know, forget what everybody thinks. Who cares? As long as I take care of my family. Yeah. Might have to join the, the Swabies, the, Army, <laughs> the Navy. <laughs> the Navy, right? So, so if you were, if you uh, enlisted, okay, into the military, okay, and the scripture says that therefore endure hardness, all right, and when the alarm would sound, okay, and you're used to sleeping your whole life, you've been sleeping, waking up whenever time you want to, and now you got to wake up at zero dark thirty. Okay, and you gotta be out there. You you would better be out there information, because when they take roll call, if you're not there, guess what? You miss movement. You miss the movement. You miss the formation. Okay, the 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 sergeant that's calling the roll is gonna say, oh, oh, Danny, Danny Lopez. Okay, Just put a circle around that. <laughs> okay, he'll show up later and and run out behind them when they take off, and there he is, right? But he's not going to get away with nothing. He's already got his name. He wasn't there. Okay, so as soon as he, they come back and they shower up and everything, Lopez, first sergeant wants to see you. Uh oh, he's got to go and see first sergeant, first sergeant White. <laughs> you don't want me. You do not want to see him. Okay, and then he's going to send you. He's going to send you uh, to do some duties. <laughs> he's going to sign you some duties. Okay. And you're not going to like them. Oh, you're not going to like those duties he sends you. Okay? And, uh, hey, but what does the scripture say? Now, therefore, endure hardness. Hardness. Endure hardness. Okay? As a faithful soldier. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we ran out of time. So we're going to pause right there. Any questions on what we covered so far? Not very much on the order of the camp. But uh, it's going to get really good. It's going to get really, really good. All right? So we'll pause right here. Uh, give uh, uh, Joshua a, a chance to get his donut and coffee. All right? And uh, so he's not rushed and hurried. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the lesson this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you uh, bless the, the morning service to follow, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.